Lord Ullin's Daughter by Thomas Campbell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator Adrian Stevens as the chieftain Adam Bielka as the boatman Sonia as the lady And Thomas Peter as Lord Ullin Lord Ullin's Daughter A chieftain to the highlands bound cries boatman do not tarry and i'll give thee a silver pound to row us o'er the ferry now who be ye would cross Loch Isle, this dark and stormy water oh i am the chief of ulva's isle and this lord ullin's daughter and fast before her father's men three days we fled together for should ye find us in the glen my blood would stain the heather his horsemen hard behind us ride, should they our steps discover, then who will cheer my bonny bride when they have slain her lover? Out spoke the hardy Highland wight. I'll go, my chief, I'm ready. It is not for your silver bright, but for your winsome lady. And by my word the bonny bird in danger shall not tarry. So though the waves are raging white, I'll row you o'er the ferry. By this the storm grew loud apace, The water wraith was shrieking, And in the scowl of heaven each face Grew dark as they were speaking. But still as wilder grew the wind, And as the night grew drearer, Adown the glen rode armoured men, Their trampling sounded nearer. Oh, hasty, haste, the lady cries, Though tempests round us gather, I'll meet the raging of the skies, but not an angry father. The boat has left a stormy land, a stormy sea before her, when, oh, too strong for human hand, the tempest gathered o'er her. And still they rode amidst the roar of waters fast prevailing. Lord Ullin reached the fatal shore, his wrath was changed to wailing. For sore dismayed through storm and shade, his child he did discover, one lovely hand she stretched for aid, and one was round her lover. Come back, come back, he cried in grief, across the stormy water, and I'll forgive your highland chief, my daughter, oh, my daughter. T'was vain, the loud waves lashed the shore, return or aid preventing. The waters wild went o'er his child, and he was left lamenting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Marmion and Douglas From Marmion, Canto Six By Sir Walter Scott From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Katarina Glovala as the narrator. Adrian Stevens as Douglas. And Adam Bielka as Marmion. Marmion and Douglas. From Marmion. Canto 6. Not far advanced was morning day, when Marmion did his troops array to Surrey's camp to ride. He had safe conduct for his band, beneath the royal seal and hand, and Douglas gave a guide. The ancient earl with stately grace would Clara on her palfrey place, and whispered in an undertone, Let the hawk stoop, his prey is flown. The train from out the castle drew, but Marmion stopped to bid adieu. Thou something I might plain, he said, of cold respect to stranger guest, sent hither by your king's behest. While in Tantalon's towers I stayed, part we in friendship from your land, and noble earl, receive my hand. But Douglas round him drew his cloak, folded his arms, and thus he spoke. My manors, halls, and bowers shall still be open, at my sovereign's will, to each one whom he lists, howe'er unmeet to be the owner's peer. My castles are my king's alone, from turret to foundation stone, the hand of Douglas is his own, and never shall, in friendly grasp, the hand of such as Marmion clasp. Burned Marmion's swarthy cheek like fire, 
and shook his very frame for Aya, and this to me, he said, and weren't it for thy hoary beard, such hand as Marmion's had not spared, to cleave the Douglas's head, and first I tell thee, haughty peer, he who does England's message here, although the meanest in her state, may well, proud Angus, be thy mate. And Douglas, more I tell thee here, even in thy pitch of pride, here in thy hold thy vassals near. Nay, never look upon your lord, and lay your hands upon your sword. I tell thee, thou art defied, and if thou saidest, I am not peer, to any lord in Scotland here, lowland or highland, far or near, Lord Angus, thou hast lied. On the earl's cheek the flush of rage o'ercame the ashen hue of age. Fierce he broke forth, And darest thou then to beard the lion in his den, the Douglas in his hall, and hopest thou hence unscathed to go? No! By St. Bride of Bothwell, no! Up, drawbridge, grooms, what, warder? Ho, let the portcullis fall. Lord Marmion turned, well was his need, and dashed the rowels in his steed. Like an arrow through the archway sprung, the ponderous grate behind him rung. To pass, there was such scanty room, the bars descending raised his plume. The steed along the drawbridge flies, just as it trembled on the rise. Not lighter does the swallow skim along the smooth lake's level brim. And when Lord Marmion reached his band, he halts and turns with clenched hand, and shout of loud defiance pours, and shook his gauntlet at the towers. Horse, horse! The Douglas cried. And chase! But soon he reined his fury's pace. A royal messenger he came, though most unworthy of the name. St. Mary, mend my fiery mood, old age ne'er cools the Douglas' blood. I thought to slay him where he stood. Tis pity of him, too, he cried. Bold can he speak, and fairly ride. I'll warrant him a warrior tried. With this his mandate he recalls, and slowly seeks his castle halls. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fitzjames and Roderick Dhu from The Lady of the Lake, Canto V by Sir Walter Scott. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator. Adrian Stevens as Fitzjames. And Adam Bialka as Roderick Dhu. Fitzjames and Roderick Dhu from The Lady of the Lake. Canto five. I am by promise tried to match me with this man of pride. Twice have I sought Clan Alpine's glen in peace, but when I come again, I come with banner, brand, and bow, as leader seek this mortal foe. For lovelorn swain in lady's bower ne'er panted for the appointed hour as I, until before me stand this rebel chieftain and his band. Have then thy wish, he whistled shrill, and he was answered from the hill, wild as the scream of the curlew, from crag to crag the signal flew, instant through copse and heath the rose, bonnet and spears and bended bows, on right, on left, above, below, sprung up at once the lurking foe, from shingles grey their lances start, the bracken bush sends forth the dart, the rushes and the willow wand are bristling into axe and brand, and every tuft of broom gives life to plaided warriors armed for strife. That whistle garrison the glen at once with full five hundred men, as if the yawning hill to heaven a subterranean host had given. Watching their leader's beck and will, all silent there they stood and still, like the loose crags whose threatening mass lay tottering o'er the hollow pass as if an infant's touch could urge their headlong passage down the verge. With step and weapon forward flung, upon the mountain's side they hung, 
The mountaineer cast glance of pride along Ben Leddy's living side, then fixed his eye and sable brow full on Fitch James. How sayest thou now? These are Clan Alpine's warriors true, and Saxon, I am Roderick Dhu. Fitz James was brave, though to his heart the life blood thrilled with sudden start. He manned himself with dauntless air, returned the chief his haughty stare. His back against the rock he bore, and firmly placed his foot before. Come one, come all. This rock shall fly from its firm base as soon as I. Sir Roderick marked, and in his eyes respect was mingled with surprise, and the stem joy which warriors feel in foemen worthy of their steel. Short spaced he stood, then waved his hand, down sunk the disappearing band, each warrior vanishing where he stood, in broom or bracken, heath or wood, sunk brand and spear and bended bow, in osseous pale and copses low. It seemed as if their mother earth had swallowed up her warlike birth. The wind's last breath had tossed in air, pennon and plaid and plumage fair. The next but swept a lone hillside, where heath and fern were waving wide. The sun's last glance was glinted back, from spear and glaive, from targ and jack. The next all unreflected shone, on bracken green and cold grey stone. Fitzjames looked round, yet scarce believed the witness that his sight received. Such apparition well might seem delusion of a dreadful dream. Sir Roderick in suspense he eyed, and to his look the chief replied, Fear not, nay, that I need not say, but doubt not aught from mine array. Thou art my guest, I pledged my word as far as Colin Togol ford, nor would I call a clansman's brand for aid against one valiant hand. Though on our strife lay every vale, rent by the Saxon from the gale, so move we on. I only meant to show the reed on which you lent, deeming this path you might pursue without a pass from Roderick Dhu. They moved. I said Fitzjames was brave, as ever knight that belted glaive, yet dare not say that now his blood kept on its wont and tempered flood, as following Roderick's stride he drew that seeming lonesome pathway through, which yet by fearful proof was rife with lances that, to take his life, waited but signal from a guide so late dishonoured and defied. Ever by stealth his eyes sought round the vanished guardians of the ground, and still from copse and heather deep Fancy saw spear and broadsword peep, and in the plover's shrilly strain the signal whistle heard again. Nor breathed he free till far behind the pass was left, for then they wind along a wide and level green, where neither tree nor tuft was seen, nor rush nor bush of broom was near to hide a bonnet or a spear. The chief in silence strode before, and reached that torrent's sounding shore, which daughter of three mighty lakes, from Venachar in silver breaks, sweeps through the plain and ceaseless mines, on Bowcastle the mouldering lines, where Rome, the empress of the world, of yore her eagle wings unfurled, and here his course the chieftain stayed, threw down his target and his plaid, and to the lowland warrior said, Bold Saxon. To his promise just, Vish Alpine has discharged his trust. This murderous chief, this ruthless man, this head of a rebellious clan, hath led thee safe through watch and ward, far past Clan Alpine's utmost guard. Now, man to man, and steel to steel, a chieftain's vengeance thou shalt feel. See here, all vantageless I stand, armed like thyself with single brand. For this is coil and toggle ford, and thou must keep thee with thy sword. The Saxon paused. I ne'er delayed, when foeman bade me draw my blade. Nay more, brave chief, I vowed thy death. 
yet sure thy fair and generous face, and my deep debt for life preserved, a better meed have well deserved. Can naught but blood our feud atone? Are there no means? No, stranger, none. And here, to fire thy flagging zeal, the Saxon cause rests on thy steel. For thus spoke fate by prophet bred between the living and the dead. Who spills the foremost foeman's life, his party conquers in the strife. Then, by my word, the Saxon said, The riddle is already read. Seek yonder break beneath the cliff. There lies red Murdoch, stark and stiff. Thus fate hath solved her prophecy. Then yield to fate, and not to me. To James at Stirling let us go, when, if thou wilt be still his foe, or if the king shall not agree, to grant thee grace and favour free, I plight mine honour, oath, and word, that, to thy native strengths restored, with each advantage shalt thou stand, that aids thee now to guard thy land. Dark lightning flashed from Roderick's eye. Soars thy presumption then so high, because a wretched kern ye slew. Homage to a name to Roderick do, he yields not he to man nor fate, thou addest but fuel to my hate. My clansman's blood demands revenge. Not yet prepared, by heaven I change my thought, and hold thy valour light as that of some vain carpet knight, who ill deserved my courteous care, and whose best boast is but to wear a braid of his fair lady's hair. I thank thee, Roderick, for the word. It nerves my heart, it steals my sword, for I have sworn this braid to stain in the best blood that warms thy vein. Now, truce, farewell, and Ruth, begone, Yet think not that by thee alone proud chief can courtesy be shown, though not from copse or heath or cairn, start at my whistle, clansman stern, of this small horn one feeble blast would fearful odds against thee cast, but fear not, doubt not, which thou wilt, we try this quarrel hilt to hilt. Then each at once his falchion drew, each on the ground his scabbard threw, each looked to sun and stream and plain, as what they ne'er might see again. Then foot and point and eye opposed, in dubious strife they darkly closed. Ill fared it then with Roderick Dew, that on the field his targe he threw, whose brazen studs and tough bull hide had death so often dashed aside. For trained abroad his arms to wield, Fitz James' blade was sword and shield. He practised every pass and ward, to thrust, to strike, to feint, to guard. While less expert, though stronger far, the gale maintained unequal war. Three times in closing strife they stood, and thrice the Saxon blade drank blood. No stinted draught, no scanty tide, the gushing floods, the tartans died. Fierce Roderick felt the fatal drain, and showered his blows like wintry rain. And as firm rock or castle roof against the winter shower is proof, the foe, invulnerable still, foiled his wild rage by steady skill. Till at advantage ten his brand, forced Roderick's weapon from his hand, and backwards borne upon the lee, brought the proud chieftain to his knee. Now yield thee, or by him who made the world, thy heart's blood dyes my blade. Thy threats, thy mercy, I defy. Let recreant yield who fears to die. Like adder darting from his coil, like wolf that dashes through the toil, like mountain cat who guards her young, full at Fitz James's throat he sprung. Received but wrecked, not of a wound, and locked his arms, his foemen round. Now, gallant Saxon, hold thine own. No maiden hand is round thee thrown. That desperate grasp thy frame might feel, Through bars of brass and triple steel. They tug, they strain, down, down they go, The gale above, Fitz James below. The chieftain's gripe his throat compressed, His knee was planted in his breast. 
His clotted locks he backward threw, Across his brow his hand he drew, From blood and mist to clear his sight, Then gleamed aloft his dagger bright. But hate and fury ill supplied The stream of life's exhausted tide, And all too late the advantage came To turn the odds of deadly game. For while the dagger gleamed on high, Reeled soul and sense reeled brain and eye, Down came the blow, but in the heath The erring blade found bloodless sheath. The struggling foe may now unclasp, The fainting chief's relaxing grasp, Unwounded from the dreadful close, But breathless all, Fitz James arose. He faltered thanks to heaven for life, Redeemed unhoped from desperate strife. Next on his foe his look he cast, Whose every gasp appeared his last. In Roderick's gore he dipped the braid. Poor Blanche, thy wrongs are dearly paid, Yet with thy foe must die or live The praise that faith and valour give. With that he blew a bugle note, And did the collar from his throat, And bonneted and by the wave Sat down his brow and hands to lave. Then faint afar I heard the feet Of rushing steeds in gallop fleet. The sounds increase, and now are seen Four mounted squires in Lincoln green. Two who bear lance and two who lead By loosened rein a saddled steed. Each onward held his headlong course, And by Fitz James reined up his horse. With wonder viewed the bloody spot. Exclaim not, gallants, question not, You, Herbert and Luffness, alight, And bind the wounds of yonder knight, let the grey palfrey bear his weight. We destined for a fair freight, and bring him on to Stirling Strait. I will before at better speed to seek fresh horse and fitting weed. The sun rides high. I must be boon to see the archer game at noon. But likely Bayard clears the lee. De Vaux and Herries, follow me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fitz James and Ellen from The Lady of the Lake, Canto Six by Sir Walter Scott, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Seven, Descriptive and Narrative, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Adrian Stevens as the narrator, Katarina Glovala as Ellen, and Thomas Peter as Fitz James. Fitz James and Ellen from The Lady of the Lake, Canto Six. A footstep struck her ear and Snowdoon's graceful night was near. She turned the hastier, lest again the prisoner should renew his strain. Oh, welcome, brave Fitz James, she said. How may an almost orphan maid pay the deep debt? Oh, say not so. To me no gratitude you owe. Not mine, alas, the boon to give, and bid thy noble father live. I can but be thy guide, sweet maid, with Scotland's king thy suit to aid. No tyrant he, though ire and pride may lead his better mood aside. Come, Ellen, come, tis more than time he holds his court at morning prime. With beating heart and bosom wrung, as to a brother's arm she clung, gently he dried the falling tear, and gently whispered hope and cheer. Her faltering steps half led, half stayed through galley fair and high arcade till at his touch its wings of pride a portal arch unfolded wide within twas brilliant all and light a thronging scene of figures bright it glowed on ellen's dazzled sight as when the setting sun has given ten thousand hues to summer even and from their tissue fancy frames aerial knights and fairy dames Still, by Fitzjames her footing stayed, A few faint steps she forward made, Then slow her drooping head she raised, And fearful round the presence gazed. For him she sought who owned this state, The dreaded prince whose will was fate. She gazed on many a princely port, Might well have ruled a royal court. On many a splendid garb she gazed, Then turned bewildered and amazed, For all stood bare, 
and in the room Fitzjames alone wore cap and plume. To him each lady's look was lent, on him each courtier's eye was bent. Midst furs and silks and jewels sheen, he stood in simple Lincoln green, the centre of the glittering ring, and Snowdoon's knight is Scotland's king. As wreath of snow on mountain breast slides from the rock that gave it rest, poor Ellen glided from her stay, and at the monarch's feet she lay. No word her choking voice commands, she showed the ring, she clasped her hands. Oh, not a moment could he brook, the generous prince, that suppliant look. Gently he raised her, and the while, checked with a glance the circle's smile, graceful but grave, her brow he kissed, and bade her terrors be dismissed. Yes, fair, the wandering poor Fitz James, the fields he of Scotland claims. To him thy woes, thy wishes bring, he will redeem his signet ring. Ask not for Douglas, yes to even his prince, and he have much forgiven. Wrong hath he had from slanderous tongue, I from his rebel kinsman wrong. We would not to the vulgar crowd yield what they craved with clamour loud. Calmly we heard and judged his cause, our counsel aided and our laws. I staunched thy father's death feud stern with stout devoe and grey glencairn. And Bothwell's lord henceforth we own, The friend and bulwark of our throne. But, lovely infidel, how now? What clouds thy misbelieving brow? Lord James of Douglas, lend thine aid. Thou must confirm this doubting maid. Then forth the noble Douglas sprung, And on his neck his daughter hung. The monarch drank that happy hour, The sweetest, holiest draught of power when it can say the godlike voice, Arise, sad virtue, and rejoice. Yet would not James, the general eye, On nature's raptures long should pry, He stepped between. Nay, Douglas, nay, steal not my proselyte away. The riddle is my right to read, That brought this happy chance to speed. Yes, Ellen, when disguised I stray In life's more low but happier way, Tis under name which veils my power, nor falsely veils, for Stirling's tower of yore the name of Snowdon claims, and Normans call me James Fitz James. Thus watch I o'er insulted laws, thus learn to right the injured cause. Then in a tone apart and low, Ah, little traitress, none must know what idle dream, what lighter thought, what vanity full dearly bought. Join to thine eyes a dark witchcraft, Drew my spellbound steps to Benvenue In dangerous hour, and all but gave Thy monarch's life to mountain glaive. Aloud he spoke. Thou still dost hold that little talisman of gold, Pledge of my faith, Fitzjames' ring. What seeks fair Ellen of the king? Full well the conscious maiden guessed, He probed the weakness of her breast, but with that consciousness there came a lightning of her fears for Graham, and more she deemed the monarch's ire kindled against him, who, for her sire, rebellious broadsword boldly drew, and to her generous feeling true, she craved the grace of Roderick Dhu. Forbear thy suit, the king of kings alone can stay life's parting wings. I know his heart, I know his hand, have shared his cheer, and proved his brand. My fairest earldom would I give to bid Clan Alpine's chieftain live. Hast thou no other boon to crave, no other captive friend to save? Blushing, she turned her from the king, and to the Douglas gave the ring, as if she wished her sire to speak the suit that stained her glowing cheek. Nay, then, my pledge has lost its force, and stubborn justice holds her course. Malcolm, Come forth. And, at the word, down knelt the Graham to Scotland's lord. For thee, rash youth, no suppliant sues. From thee may vengeance claim her dues. Who, nurtured underneath our smile, Hast paid our care by treacherous wile, And sought amid thy faithful clan 
a refuge for an outlawed man, dishonoring thus thy loyal name, Fetus and warder for the grame. His chain of gold the king unstrung, the links o'er Malcolm's neck he flung, then gently drew the glittering band and laid the clasp on Alan's hand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mucklemoud Meg by James Ballantyne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7 Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator Sonia as the dame Adrian Stevens as the lord And Jason in Canada as Watt Scott Mucklemoud Meg Oh, why hey, you brought us same now, my brave lord? strap it not over his braid saddle-bow some bold border reaver to feast at our board in hairy our pantry i trow he's burly and stalwart in lith and in limb gin you were his master in war the field was a saft enough litter for him he need na have brought him so far then saddle and mount again harness and don't again and when you get home again strike higher game hoot wist ye my dame for he comes a good kin and boasts o a lang pedigree this night he mourn share o a good cheer within at morning's grey dawn he mourn thee he's gallant wat scott heir o proud harden ha wha ettled our lands clear to sweep but now he is snug in old ellibank's paw and shall swing frae a dungeon keep though saddle and munt again harness and dunt again I'll ne'er, when I hunt again, strike higher game. Is this young Wat Scott? And would you rach his craig, when our daughter is fay for a man? Gay God loom, marry our muckle-mode Meg, or we'll never get the jaw off our hand. Odd, here our good wife, she would fain save your life. Wat Scott, will you marry or hang? But Meg's muckle-mode set young Wat's heart to grew. Wa swore to the woody he'd gang, ne'er saddle nor munt again, harness nor dunt again, but ne'er shall hunt again, ne'er see his haim. Sign Mucklemoud Meg pressed in close to his side, and blinket for sleely and kind. But eyes what glared on his bra proffered bride, he shook like a leaf in the wind. A bride or a gallows, a rope or a wife. The morning dawned sunny and clear. What boldly strode forward to part with his life, till he saw Maggie shedding a tear. Then saddle and munt again, harness and dunt again, fain would what hunt again, fain would he haim. Meg's tear touched his bosom, the gibbet frowned high, and slowly what strode to his doom. He gave a glance round with a tear in his eye, Meg shone like a star through the gloom. She rushed to his arms, they were wed on the spot, and lord either muckle and lang nee bold border laird had a wife like what scott twas better to marry than hang so saddle and munt again harness and dunt again ellie bank hunt again what snug at hame end of poem this recording is in the public domain the heart of the bruce by william edmundstone ayton from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Katharina Glovala as the narrator. Adrian Stevens as Lord Douglas. Thomas Peter as the Pilgrim. Adam Bielka as Sir Simon of the Lee. And Jason in Canada as King Alonzo. The Heart of the Bruce. It was upon an April morn, while yet the frost lay hoar, we heard Lord James's bugle horn sound by the rocky shore. Then down we went, a hundred knights, all in our dark array, and flung our armour in the ships that rode within the bay. We spoke not as the shore grew less, but gazed in silence back, where the long billows swept away the foam behind our track. And I, the purple hues decayed upon the fading hill, and but one heart in all that ship was tranquil, cold, and still. The good Lord Douglas paced the deck, 
and oh, his face was wan, unlike the flush it used to wear when in the battle van. Come hither, come hither, my trusty knight, Sir Simon of the Lee. There is a fright lays near my soul, I fain would tell to thee. Thou knowest the words King Robert spoke upon his dying day, how he bade take his noble heart and carry it far away, and lay it in the holy soil where once the Saviour trod, since he might not bear the blessed cross, nor strike one blow for God. Last night, as in my bed I lay, I dreamed a dreary dream. Methought I saw a pilgrim stand in the moonlight's quivering beam. His robe was of the azure dye, snow-white his scattered hairs, and even such a cross he bore as good St. Andrew bears. Why go ye forth, Lord James, he said, with spear and belted brand? Why do you take its dearest pledge from this our Scottish land? The sultry breeze of Galilee creeps through its groves of palm. The olives on the holy mount stand glittering in the calm. But tis not there that Scotland's art shall rest by God's decree, till the great angel calls the dead to rise from earth and sea. Lord James of Douglas, mark my read, that heart shall pass once more in fiery fight against the foe as it was wont of yore. And it shall pass beneath the cross and save King Robert's vow, but other hands shall bear it back, not James of Douglas, thou. Now by thy knightly faith I pray, Sir Simon of the Lee, for true a friend had never man than thou hast been to me. If ne'er upon the holy land tis mine in life to tread, bear thou to Scotland's kindly earth the relics of her dead. The tear was in Sir Simon's eye as he wrung the warrior's hand. Betide me weal, betide me woe, I'll hold by thy command. But if in battle front, Lord James, tis ours once more to ride, nor force of man, nor craft of fiend, shall cleave me from thy side. And I we sailed, and I we sailed across the weary sea, until one more on the coast of Spain rose grimly on our lee. And as we rounded to the port, beneath the watchtower's wall, we heard the clash of the etabals, and the trumpet's wavering call. Why sounds young eastern music here so wantonly and long? And who's the crowd of armed men that round yon standard throng? The Moors have come from Africa to spoil and waste and slay, and King Alonso of Castile must fight with them today. Now shame it were, cried good Lord James, shall never be said of me that I and mine have turned aside from the cross in jeopardy. Have down, have down, my merry men all, have down unto the plain, we'll let the Scottish lion loose within the fields of Spain. Now welcome to me, noble lord, thou in thy stalwart power. Dear is the sight of a Christian knight who comes in such an hour. Is it for bond or faith you come, or yet for golden fee? Or bring ye France's lilies here, or the flower of Burgundy? God greet thee well, thou valiant king, thee and thy belted peers. Sir James of Douglas am I called, and these are Scottish spears. We do not fight for bond or plight, nor yet for golden fee, but for the sake of our blessed Lord who died upon the tree. We bring our great King Robert's heart across the weltering wave to lay it in the holy soil hard by the Saviour's grave. True pilgrims we, by land or sea, where danger bars the way, and therefore are we here, Lord King, to ride with thee this day. The king has bent his stately head, and the tears were in his eyne. God's blessing is on thee, noble knight, for this brave thought of thine. I know thy name full well, Lord James, and honoured may I be, that those who fought beside the Bruce should fight this day for me. Take thou the leading of the van, and charge the moors amain. There is not such a lance as thine in all the host of Spain. 
The Douglas turned towards us then. Oh, but his glance was high. There is not one of all my men but is as bold as I. There is not one of all my knights but bears as true a spear. Then onward, Scottish gentlemen, and think King Robert's here. The trumpets blew, the crossbolts flew, the arrows flashed like flame. A spur in sight and spur in rest, against the foe we came. And many a bearded Saracen went down both horse and man, for through their ranks we rode like corn, so furiously we ran. But in behind our path they closed, though fain to let us through, for they were forty thousand men, and we were wondrous few. We might not see a lance's length, so dense was their array, but the long fell sweep of the Scottish blade still held them hard at bay. Make in, make in, Lord Douglas cried. Make in, my brethren dear, Sir William of Sinclair is down, we may not leave him here. But thicker, thicker grew the swarm, and sharper shot the rain, and the horses reared amid the press, but they would not charge again. Now, Jesu, help thee, said Lord James. Thou kind and true Sinclair, and if I may not bring thee off, I'll die beside thee there. Then in his stirrups up he stood, so lion-like and bold, and held the precious heart aloft, all in its case of gold. He flung it from him, far ahead, and never spake he more, but Pass thou first, thou dauntless heart, as thou were want of yore. The roar of fire rose fiercer yet, and heavier still the store, till the spears of Spain came shivering in, and swept away the moor. Now praised be God, the day is won, they fly o'er flood and fell. Why dost thou draw the rein so hard, good knight, that fought so well? O oh, ride ye on, Lord King, he said, and leave the dead to me, for I must keep the dreariest watch that ever I shall dree. There lies above his master's heart the Douglas, stark and grim, and woe is me, I should be here, not side by side with him. The world grows cold, my arm is old, and thin my liot hair, and all that I loved best on earth is stretched before me there. O oh, Bothwell Banks, that bloom so bright beneath the sun of May, the heaviest cloud that ever blew is bound for you this day, and Scotland thou mayst veil thy head in sorrow and in pain, the sorest stroke upon thy brow hast fallen this day in Spain. We'll bear them back unto our ship, we'll bear them o'er the sea, and lay them in the hallowed earth within our own country. And be thou strong of heart, Lord King, for this I tell thee sure, the sod that drank the Douglas blood shall never bear the moor. The king he lighted from his horse, he flung his brand away, and took the Douglas by the hand, so stately as he lay. God give thee rest, thou valiant soul, that fought so well for Spain. I'd rather half my land were gone, so thou wert here again. We bore the good Lord James away, and the priceless heart we bore, and heavily we steered our ship towards the Scottish shore. No welcome greeted our return, nor clang of martial tread, but all were dumb and hushed as death before the mighty dead. We laid our chief in Douglas Kirk, the heart in fair male rose, and woeful men we were that day, God grant their souls repose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Barclay of Yuri by John Greenleaf Whittier From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Adam Bielka as the broadsword Thomas Peter as the henchman And Adrian Stevens as Barclay of Uri Barclay of Uri Up the streets of Aberdeen, by the Kirk and College Green, rode the laird of Uri. Close behind him, close beside, foul of mouth and evil-eyed, pressed the mob in fury. Flouted him the drunken churl, jeered at him the serving girl, 
prompt to please her master and the begging carlin late fed and clothed at yuri's gate cursed him as he passed her yet with calm and stately mien up the streets of aberdeen came he slowly riding and to all he saw and heard answering not with bitter word turning not for chiding came a troop with broadswords swinging bits and bridles sharply ringing loose and free and forward quoth the foremost ride him down push him prick him through the town drive the quaker coward but from out the thickening crowd cried a sudden voice and loud barclay ho oh, a barclay and the old man at his side saw a comrade battle tried scarred and sunburned darkly who with ready weapon bare fronting to the troopers there cried aloud god save us call ye coward him who stood ankle deep in lutzen's blood with the brave gustavus nay i do not need thy sword comrade mine said yuri's lord put it up i pray thee passive to his holy will trust i in my master still even though he slay me pledges of thy love and faith proved on many a field of death not by me are needed marvelled much that henchman bold that his laird so stout of old now so meekly pleaded woe's the day he sadly said with a slowly shaking head and a look of pity yuri's honest lord reviled mock of knave and sport of child in his own good city speak the word and master mine as we charged on tilly's line and his walloon lancers smiting through their midst we'll teach civil look and decent speech to these boyish prancers marvel not mine ancient friend like beginning like the end quoth the laird of yuri is the sinful servant more than his gracious lord who bore bonds and stripes in jury give me joy that in his name i can bear with patient frame all these vain ones offer while for them he suffered long shall i answer wrong with wrong scoffing with a scoffer happier i with loss of all hunted outlawed held in thrall with few friends to greet me than when reeve and squire were seen riding out from aberdeen with bared heads to meet me when each good wife o'er and o'er blessed me as i passed her door and the snooded daughter through her casement glancing doon smiled on him who bore renown from red fields of slaughter hard to feel the stranger's scoff hard the old friends falling off hard to learn forgiving but the lord his own rewards and his love with theirs accords warm and fresh and living through this dark and stormy night faith beholds a feeble light up the blackness streaking knowing god's own time is best in a patient hope i rest for the full day breaking so the laird of yuri said turning slow his horse's head towards the tollbooth prison where through iron gates he heard poor disciples of the word preach of christ arisen not in vain confessor old unto us the tale is told of thy day of trial every age on him who strays from its broad and beaten ways pours its sevenfold vial happy he whose inward ear angel comfortings can hear over the rebel's laughter and while hatred's faggots burn glimpses through the smoke discern of the good hereafter knowing this that never yet share of truth was vainly set in the world's white fellow after hands shall sow the seed after hands from hill and mead reap the harvest's yellow thus with somewhat of a seer must the moral pioneer from the future borrow clothe the waste with dreams of grain and on midnight sky of rain paint the golden morrow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
the fight of the armstrong privateer by james jeffrey roche from the world's best poetry volume seven descriptive and narrative part two read for LibriVox.org by adam bielka as the narrator thomas peter as the portuguese sonia as the privateer's man adrian stevens as the english admiral jason in canada as the yankee and katarina glovala as the dying sailor the fight of the armstrong privateer tell the story to your sons of the gallant days of yore when the brig of seven guns fought the fleet of seven score from the set of sun till morn through the long september night ninety men against two thousand and the ninety won the fight in the harbor of file the azor three lofty british ships came a-sailing to file one was a line of battleship and two were frigates tall nelson's valiant men of war brave as britons ever are man the guns they served so well at abokir and trafalgar lord dundonald and his fleet at jamaica far away waited eager for their coming fretted sore at their delay there was loot for British valor on the Mississippi coast, in the beauty and the booty that the Creole cities boast. There were rebel knaves to swing, there were prisoners to bring, home in fetters to old England for the glory of the king. At the setting of the sun and the ebbing of the tide came the great ships one by one with their portals opened wide, and their cannon frowning down on the castle and the town and the privateer that lay close inside came the eighteen-gun carnation and the rota forty-four and the triple-decked plantagenet an admiral's pennon bore and the privateer grew smaller as their topmasts towered taller and she bent her springs and anchored by the castle on the shore spake the noble portuguese to the stranger have no fear they are neutral waters these and your ship is sacred here, as if fifty stout armadas stood to shelter you from harm, for the honour of the Briton will defend you from his arm. But the privateersman said, Well, we know the Englishmen, and their faith is written red in the Dartmoor slaughter pen. Come what fortune God may send, we will fight them to the end, and the mercy of the sharks may spare us then. Seize the pirate where she lies cried the english admiral if the portuguese protect her all the west for portugal and four launches at his bidding leaped impatient for the fray speeding shoreward where the armstrong grim and dark and ready lay twice she hailed and gave them warning but the feeble menace scorning on they came in splendid silence till a cable's length away then the yankee pivot spoke Pico's thousand echoes woke, and four baffled, beaten launches drifted helpless on the bay. Then the wrath of Lloyd arose, till the lion roared again, and he called out all his launches, and he called five hundred men, and he gave the word, No quarter, and he sent them forth to smite. Heaven help the foe before him when the Briton comes in might. Heaven helped the little Armstrong in her hour of bitter need. God Almighty nerved the heart and guided well the arm of reed. Launches to port and starboard, launches forward and aft, fourteen launches together striking the little craft. They hacked at the boarding nettings, they swarmed above the rail, but the long tom roared from his pivot and the grape shot fell like hail pike and pistol and cutlass and hearts that knew not fear bulwarks of brawn and metal guarded the privateer and ever where the fight was fierce the form of reed was seen ever where foes drew nearest his quick sword fell between once in the deadly strife the border's leader pressed forward of all the rest challenging life for life but ere their blades had crossed a dying sailor tossed his pistol to reed and cried now 
Riddle the lovers hide. But the privateersman laughed and flung the weapon aside, and he drove his blade to the hilt, and the foeman gasped and died. Then the boarders took to their launches, laden with hurt and dead, but little with glory burdened, and out of the battle fled. Now the tide was at flood again, and the night was almost done, when the sloop of war came up with her odds of two to one, and she opened fire, but the Armstrong answered her gun for gun, and the gay carnation wilted in half an hour of sun. Then the Armstrong, looking seaward, saw the mighty seventy-four, with her triple tier of cannon drawing slowly to the shore. And the dauntless captain said, Take our wounded and our dead, bear them tenderly to land, for the Armstrong's days are o'er, but no foe shall tread her deck, and no flag above it wave, to the ship that saved our honor we will give a shipman's grave. So they did as he commanded, and they bore their mates to land, with the figurehead of Armstrong and the good sword in his hand. Then they turned the long tom downward, and they pierced her oaken side, and they cheered her, and they blessed her, and they sunk her in the tide. Tell the story to your sons, when the haughty stranger boasts of his mighty ships and guns, and the muster of his hosts. How the word of God was witnessed in the gallant days of yore, when the twenty fled from one ere the rising of the sun. In the harbor of File, the Azor. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Drifted Out to Sea by Rose Hartwick Thorpe. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 7, Descriptive and Narrative, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org. By Sonia as the narrator. Adam Bielka as the mate. And Jason in Canada as the captain. Drifted out to sea. Two little ones, grown tired of play, roamed by the sea one summer day, watching the great waves come and go, prattling as children will, you know of dolls and marbles kites and strings sometimes hinting at graver things at last they spied within their reach an old boat cast upon the beach helter-skelter with merry din over its sides they scrambled in ben with his tangled nut-brown hair bess with her sweet face flushed and fair rolling in from the briny deep nearer nearer the great waves creep higher higher upon the sands reaching out with their giant hands grasping the boat in boisterous glee tossing it up and out to sea the sun went down mid clouds of gold night came with footsteps damp and cold day dawned the hours crept slowly by and now across the sunny sky a black cloud stretches far away and shuts the golden gates of day a storm comes on with flash and roar while all the sky is shrouded o'er the great waves rolling from the west bring night and darkness on their breast still floats the boat though driving storm protected by god's powerful arm the home-bound vessel seabird lies in ready trim twixt sea and skies her captain paces restless now a troubled look upon his brow while all his nerves with terror thrill the shadow of some coming ill the mate comes up to where he stands and grasps his arm with eager hands a boat has just swept past says he bearing two children out to sea tis dangerous now to put about yet they cannot be saved without not but their safety will suffice they must be saved the captain cries by every thought that's just and right my lips i hoped to kiss to-night i'll peril vessel life and men and god will not forsake us then with anxious faces one and all each man responded to the call and when at last through driving storm 
they lifted up each little form the captain started with a groan my god is good they are my own end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of the world's best poetry volume 7 descriptive and narrative part 2